The printer's manuscript is a copy. It's a copy of the original manuscript. Um, for recovering the uh, earliest text of the Book of Mormon, the printer's manuscript is overall our best source. The reason for this is that the original manuscript, the, the one that the scribes wrote down as Joseph Smith dictated it, is only about 28% extant. Uh, Joseph Smith placed the original in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo House, and it was taken out, that was in 1841, and 41 years later, uh, Louis Bideman, second husband of Emma's, uh, removed it. He discovered it and removed it, and water had gotten in, and mold, and, and uh, most of the manuscript uh, was destroyed. But uh, he was able to retrieve probably 30% of the original, and, um, and we have about 28% of that left. Uh, that, that, um, 25 of the 28 is uh, in, the, in our church archives. So uh, we have the original, and um, we're very glad to have what we do have. We wish we had the whole thing, but we don't. So in lieu of that, we have the printer's manuscript. The printer's manuscript was the copy that Oliver Cowdery and two other scribes helped him make. They, uh, Oliver began in August of 1829 making the copy. He first made 24 sheets, and, uh, and those were the 24, or not 24, 24 pages. They were uh, six large sheets folded and then written on, so you ended up with 24 pages, 12 leaves, six folded sheets. Anyway, he took, it's called a gathering, and he took this uh, to uh, Grandin's print shop, and uh, John Gilbert proceeded to set the type late August, maybe the 27th or so of August. And so they started the work of the typesetting. Uh, it's important to realize several things that uh, one reason for the printer's manuscript is that Joseph was worried that if they only had one manuscript that they, and they took that into the press, the print shop, it might get lost. And of course, Joseph had learned from the 116 pages, I'd better have a copy, a backup. So they made the copy and they took it in. Now, the copy was not made all at once. It was made as they needed copy, and the evidence suggests that they, they started in August of 1829 with the first 24 pages, the first gathering of the printer's manuscript, and it seems like they finished the printer's manuscript, completed it in the latter part of January 1830. Uh, we know that on about, I think, November 6th, 1829, um, Oliver had gotten to Alma uh, 36, where it starts out talking, uh, Alma talks to his son, Helaman. And he writes a letter to Joseph Smith saying, we have gotten to where Alma uh, gives his commandments to his sons. And we can actually see on the manuscript uh, that day where he had written that and where he had stopped and then where he started up again. So we know he would, would have been about, I think, a month ahead of the typesetter. So they were keeping ahead as they uh, progressed in producing this uh, manuscript. Um, another thing that's important to realize is they made mistakes. Uh, Oliver is making about what we about three substantive errors, mistakes, changes. Now, the word substantive is a technical term here. It doesn't mean meaning changing. It just means any change in the words. It doesn't mean the spelling. It just means if you delete the word a uh, or you add the word the, if you make a singular into a plural, these are called substantive changes. There's no punctuation, really. They're not, there's no punctuation in the original to speak of, and Oliver occasionally put in a little punctuation, and uh, another scribe that helped him, we call him Scribe 2, hasn't been identified, 
put more in. Uh, but the typesetter was ignoring the punctuation that they provided occasionally and was just doing it himself. John Gilbert was deciding the punctuation. About a third of the time he'd mark up the manuscript before he would set the type, but two-thirds the time he did the punctuation as he set the type, which is quite a feat, actually. So there is no, it isn't punctuation, but what it would be, a non-substantive difference would be, suppose he changed, um, he capitalized a word for some reason, or changed the spelling. Maybe in the original it was L-A-B-O-R, labor, and he would spell it in the printers, L-A-B-O-U-R. Well, these are non-substantive. That is, we call these accidentals. They're not really a mis accidental mistakes. They're just, they're not significant in terms of uh, the actual words. But if you change labor to labors, you add an S, then you've made a substantive change. Now, that, that seems, you know, you know, people say, well, how many changes really make a difference, you know? And most of them don't. Most of them are rather minor that wouldn't show up in translations. But uh, we count them as changes. And so every manuscript page, Oliver is making about three. And the typesetter, when he's setting from the, the printers, to, in, to producing the 1830 is making about three substantive changes per manuscript page. But, as I've indicated, they're not ones to go shouting about, you know. They're not really making huge differences in meaning normally. There are some that where they got the word wrong, they make a, they make a change in meaning, but those, I would say, are less than 5%, you know, they, and they are never ones, though, that change the doctrine or uh, change the narrative in any really basic way. So the, there are no changes that really get in the way of the book. I think this is important to, uh, to realize. Probably, I, I think it's basically in the Smith home, only what a how many miles? It's a short distance from Palmyra, and they would bring in the manuscript from there. It does appear that they would go in with manuscript that it would be necessary, and it would be probably in the evening when they would get back. When and Oliver was there at the press, press all day long, as they were, so he would probably do his copy work at night when he would get back. So. Um, it's not surprising that he might have gotten tired sometimes in, in this. It was quite laborious. And this scribe, too, takes over for him, uh, does about, I believe, 14% of the printer's manuscript. And that scribe is relieved by Hiram Smith a few times, just briefly. It's, it, they're very brief when Hiram takes over. So... Um, we have three scribes on the printer's manuscript. And um, so in any event, uh, they, um, they were working um, sort of steadily. It looks like uh, Oliver in his copy work had basically gotten to 3rd Nephi 19 in January and a crisis developed. And it was that Abner Cole had seen the sheets there in the press. He was using the press on Sundays to print his newspaper, his local newspaper. And uh, he saw these sheets that they had printed off for the 1830, and he decided, well, I think I'll put some of this in my newspaper. So actually, the first published version of the Book of Mormon is not the actual 1830, but is this newspaper by Abner Cole. And he did a couple of issues in, in First Nephi, and uh, then he did something from Alma. And um, they uh, one, one Sunday, uh, I believe it was uh, Hiram who felt very nervous and said, I think we ought to go down and check the press. And so he and Oliver went there, and there was Abner Coles setting the type for the, you know, his own 
he, he had the sheets and was producing, and, and uh, Robbins found some indication that they might have, uh, for the Alma one, actually had some extra type still there, and just he put it back in, into his own um, forms and was using that. In any case, they, they've, they had to stop him, and they had to get Joseph to come up from in the middle of winter uh, from Susquehanna to um, exercise his right. Uh, Abner Cole wanted to fight with Joseph, and Joseph refused. He knew he had the law on his side. Uh, but this led, I think, to a very uh, something that's quite important. Um, um, they had a copyright, but it was only in the United States. And Canada was just north of them. And I don't know whether Abner Cole threatened this or not, but at least they seem to have realized that someone could pilfer sheets or something and go up to Canada and produce parts, or even if they got all the sheets, you know, and you know, produce the whole Book of Mormon, steal the the book because in we didn't the church Joseph didn't have a copyright in the British realm, and Canada was part of the British realm. So it appears like there's uh, considerable evidence that they decided we'll, we'll send Oliver and Hiram Page and apparently two other brethren to Canada in the dead of winter, February. They went for um, at least a month. They were up there, and it appears from what Hiram suggested that they produce, they take the whole printer's manuscript, try to get a printer make an agreement to publish it in the British realm in Canada, thus protecting the copyright. Um, and so they, you know, Oliver had gotten to 3rd Nephi 19 in his copy work, and it looks like he jumped ahead to Ether, and this other unknown scribe finished going from 3rd Nephi 19 up through the end of Mormon. And they worked together, apparently, so that it looks like by the end of January they had completed the printer's manuscript. So now they had a second complete copy. They had the original, and they had the printers. So they took the printers to Canada. In the meantime, they decided, we're going to take the original in to the printer in Palmyra. He didn't know this ever. He never knew there were two manuscripts that they were... They kept it from him, apparently, that they were making this copy. And, uh, and, and they, this was safe now because they had two complete copies. So from Helaman 13 through, um, through the end of Mormon, the typesetter set the Book of Mormon from the original manuscript, not from the printers. And the printers is up, you know, going to Canada and then coming back. When they got back at the end of February, they then re started using the printers once more in the print shop. So they left then the original back in, at the home. So our 1830 for five-sixths of the Book of Mormon is set from the printer's manuscript, but one-sixth of it is set from the original, from Helaman 13 through the end of Mormon. Uh, this is actually advantageous because we don't have most of the original, and it means for that part of the, for that part of the, um, of the Book of Mormon, the 1830 is actually a better text uh, because we only have an average of three mistakes per manuscript page instead of six. If you go to the other portion, see the original is copied to the printers, make three per manuscript page. Then the printer typesets and makes three more. So you get six for the rest of the Book of Mormon, but from Helaman 13 to, third ne or to the end of Mormon, you have an average of three. So there's a blessing, I suppose, in all of this extra work. So it also means that for that part of the Book of Mormon, we don't have the original pretty much, a few fragments, but we have two first-hand copies of the original. We have the 1830, for that portion, and we have the printers. So when they agree, we can think, oh, that's probably what the original read. When they disagree, we think, well, the original was one of these two, 
but which one? <laughs> so it's still not readily resolved, but it's great to have two copies. If they just made a third copy, <laughs> or if Joseph hadn't put the original into the cornerstone of the Nauvoo house, we might be safe. Well, in any event, um, so uh, the, Joseph Smith had both manuscripts. But for the, when they came to do the second edition in 1837 in Kirtland, Joseph Smith went through the printer's manuscript. Uh, it appears uh, that Oliver was, I think, working with him and had an 1830 a copy. And they were probably reading it out loud. This is some supposition, but Joseph and Oliver, maybe Oliver reading from the 1830 and Joseph checking the printer's. And Joseph was making grammatical changes, uh, changing like which to who and so forth. And he marked about 80% of his changes in the printer's manuscript with heavy black ink, a heavy flow of ink. And Oliver would have been marking up his 1830. When they came to set the type for the 1837, they used that marked up 1830 as their source for doing the typesetting. They didn't set the 1837 from the printer's manuscript again. But Oliver had the printer's manuscript. He would have had it in the press in case they needed to check something. And it was then used as a reference, we call it. You know, it wasn't what they set the type from, but it was a reference for the 37. Um, when that second edition was printed, uh, Mar or Oliver kept the printer's manuscript. So now Joseph just has the original in his possession. Oliver has the printers. A year later, Oliver is excommunicated from the church and he keeps the printer's manuscript. He has it in his possession till about 1850 when he dies. He was visiting with David Whitmer, his brother-in-law in Missouri, and uh, he had married, uh, Oliver had married one of the Whitmers, one of the Whitmer girls, Elizabeth Ann Whitmer. And so they were, vis he was visiting his brother-in-law, but he had, I believe, tuberculosis, and he suffered, and he died. And as he, when he was dying, he entrusted the printer's manuscript to David Whitmer. So David Whitmer kept that manuscript and uh, some miraculous accounts of uh, being in a tornado and being preserved and uh, somebody once trying to steal the manuscript and there were rattlesnakes under the bed that prevented them from touching it and really some credible things. And um, so he had it till 1888. But there was some concern of what manuscript he actually had. And David Whitmer thought he had the original manuscript. And Joseph F. Smith and Orson Pratt came to visit him. They wanted to look at the uh, manuscript. They wanted to hear uh, David Whitmer's testimony uh, as one of the three witnesses. And uh, so they were looking at the manuscript and David said, yes, this is the original. And Joseph F. Smith said, no, uh, we, uh, the uh, original has just been found recently in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo house, and we have some of the first part of it from First Nephi. Sarah Kimball had taken it to Salt Lake and given it to him, Joseph F. Smith, and he had given it to the, you know, the church, had it. So we know this is, this is the original. And David was insisting, you know, that he had the original. And he looked, um, uh, Joseph F. Smith was looking through it, and they, he came to the end of the manuscript, and there's the three witness and the eight witness statements. And Joseph F. Smith turns to David and says, David, is this your signature here? And he looks at the three witness, and he says, well, no, that's, that's Oliver's. Well, this is a copy then, said Joseph F. Smith to him. And he had to begrudgingly say, I, well, I guess it is. 
But I don't think he, I think he continued to say it was actually the original because uh, for many years when the RLDS bought that manuscript, they for a while insisted that they had the original, but they didn't. And uh, we can talk about that in a moment. Well, in any event, um, he, he actually had the printers, the copy. And, um, and in fact, Joseph F. Smith either or Orson Pratt said, look at all the printer's marks on here and everything and so forth. And, and they were right. It was the printer's manuscript. Of course, it's extremely valuable. Uh, the RLDS Church came to visit David Whitmer to examine the printer's manuscript during this time period. But then he died in 1888, and uh, uh, one of his sons inherited it, and they sold it for one dollar to a grandson, George Schweik. And the idea, uh, George ultimately wanted to try and sell it, and uh, he offered it to our church. And uh, it's an interesting story because now it's early 1900s, Joseph F. Smith is the prophet of the church. And he, um, we really didn't have the money to pay the ten thousand dollars that uh, that uh, George Schweik wanted the grandson for this manuscript. And um, so, I think, not fully seriously, but you know, Joseph F. Smith said we don't need another copy of the Book of Mormon. We already have thousands of copies. We don't need another copy. See, the, he had remembered this discussion with David Whitmer. This is a copy. Well, I think ultimately they would have taken it. It was money. I mean, the church was in real trouble in the early 1900s financially. So uh, we did not purchase it. But a few years later, the RLDS purchased it from George White for a little under 3000 you know, if, if, they hadn't, if he hadn't sold it to them, you know, it might have gone for $100. Who knows? But in any event, they had it, and they examined it very carefully over the next few years. They were in Lamoni, Iowa, and they printed their third edition of the Book of Mormon using changes that they found in the printer's manuscript. And many of the changes which we first put in our 1981 edition were first put in by the RLDS in 1908 based on them exam They had now the printer's manuscript. They thought it was the original. They would refer to it as such. How do you tell which one you, re you know, how do you know that they didn't get mixed up in actual fact? Well, the way you can really tell is spellings. Oliver will spell a certain way in the original manuscript. And when he was doing the printer's manuscript, they would be setting the type from it, and he would, his job was to proof it, to go through and make sure that, um, you know, they had set it right. So he'd be checking their typesetting against his handwriting. And he would notice they were changing the spellings. And every so often, Oliver apparently learned to spell a word. And in the middle of 3rd Nephi, Oliver in the printer's manuscript, Oliver finally learned how to spell exceeding. He was always, in the original throughout, he spells it E-X-C-E-D-I-N-G, one E after the X-C. And in the printer's manuscript, all the way up to 3rd Nephi, he's misspelling it. Suddenly, in 3rd Nephi, in the printers, he figured out, oh, it's double E. So he starts spelling it in the printer's manuscript, double E, and spells it correctly all the way to the end. So we have examples like this. So when we get fragments of the original, we find Oliver always misspelling it. And so we know they did not mix up the manuscripts. And uh, so when, when I went there to examine the uh, printer's manuscript in the early 90s, that was one of the big issues that they uh, asked me, and I, I went over it. And I'd already done a transcript on, uh, on fo based on photographs, and I explained, no, you have the printer's manuscript, you have the complete manuscript, and uh, so um, that has been really resolved. Um, 
Well, in any event, the RLDS Church had this. They would, they basically decided to keep the manuscript in a bank vault in a Kansas City, a few miles to the west of Independence, for safety's sake. And uh, every so often with one of their world conferences, they might have it on display and have bring it out and, uh, and have it on display. But most of the time, it was in the bank vault. So in the early 90s, after they had lent me a large photographic black and white reproduction of the printer's manuscript, uh, Dick Howard, their church historian, arranged this uh, through Jack Welch. And so I worked off of that. But when I got done, I realized, you know, I probably, I really need to look at the actual manuscript. So I was working with Ron Romy, their archivist, and I suggested, I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to arrange a trip there for a week to examine the actual manuscript, compare my transcript that I had made off of photographs with the real thing. And uh, Ron says this caused a sort of a minor crisis in the RLDS church because, first of all, I wasn't RLDS, I was LDS, and they were going to have to go to a lot of trouble to bring the manuscript out and have to have it under guard and so forth. And, but they agreed to do it, and, and I'm very grateful for that. So I drove there uh, with my wife, uh, Sirku, and um, it was in uh, May, I believe, of, uh, I think it's 1991, I to be sure, but um, sometime in the early 90s. And we started work on the actual original manuscript. Uh, Ron Romig and my wife did what we call the physical description of the manuscript, measuring the, the width of each, uh, the size of each sheet and all these kinds of physical aspects, and I was checking my transcript. I discovered, though, that I needed more time. And uh, I requested that I stay an extra week. So I ended up staying two weeks. At the end, my time became so restricted that I got a chess clock in there. And you'll see photographs of this sometime, me working there with a chess clock to the side. And I'd set it for seven minutes to check a page. And then I'd have to click it and turn the page, make sure I would get through. Well, I obviously realized that I needed something better. I needed color photographs. I discovered when I looked at the, the real manuscript that color made a huge difference. I, things that I thought were penciled in were actually cuts, little cuts that had been made with a pen knife by the typesetter. And I discovered one place that Oliver had written in a correction or two and chapter numbers in blue ink showing that he was doing it later, that the chapters and the chapter numbers were secondary. And, uh, you know, I never thought this was the case. So uh, I went back a year and a half later with my brother, uh, Nevin Skousen, who was a professional photographer, and he shot the whole manuscript in color. This was the first time it had ever been shot in color. And uh, we made a set of negatives. We made two prints from those negatives, and uh, the RLDS Church got one of them, and I got the other one, and, I, and I've used that, that color one. Since then, of course, uh, when for the Joseph Smith papers, uh, they sent out their photographer to make uh, digital photographs. We used normal you know, film from the early 90s, the regular Kodak film, but... In any event, uh, having the colored prints was very important. Um, well, in the late 90s, our church uh, went, well, when I was working with the manuscript, little bits would come off. You know, this thing is in a precarious condition. The very first leaf was always curling up at the bottom, and people kept hitting it over the years. We have photographs from about 1920 that show more of it at the bottom of this than we do now. 
And uh, so um, it was it, our church um, decided that we would do the RLDS Church a favor. We now had money, <laughs> and we we they b brought the manuscript, printer's manuscript, to Salt Lake, and we worked on it, I think, for a couple years. And uh, we washed it. We conserved it. We put it under mylar. It looks quite different than it did then. But it is now not falling apart all the time. You know, this is important. So you're we're not preserving the manuscript like it actually was, but we are preserving the text. This is the really important thing. Uh, sometimes people look at these as artifacts and they just think of the value of, oh, this is the printer's manuscript. For me, it's what it tells us about the text of the Book of Mormon and the transmission of it. So um, it's been a very interesting history and uh, and I'm very grateful the RLDS Church, now the Community of Christ, has agreed to allow the complete photographic reproduction of the manuscript. Now people can check my work. They can see if my transcript was actually correct. And you can look at good color reproduction. And on the other side, a, a transcript. That's what we'll have in these, in these manuscripts. And you can always check my transcript because I know in a few places we've had some minor disagreements about what it actually says. When you make a transcript, you do interpret it. You interpret the characters that you're reading in ink. And uh, in a few places, um, it could go one way or another. And so there are a few minor differences between my transcript and the one that will be produced by the Joseph Smith papers. And ultimately, you can look at the photograph yourself and think about it as well and maybe come up with a third reading of, of something. So that's sort of a brief, at least my experience with the manuscript. Well, I think an important thing to keep in mind um, is that the entire transmission of the text, except for what Joseph Smith is seeing, is being done by humans who can make mistakes, can get tired, and they have to catch their errors. Um, I think some people sometimes have the idea that the Lord is intervening to make sure no mistakes occur, but this isn't the case. And I think that is important. There aren't any huge errors, you know, but even sometimes occasionally the typesetter would skip a part of a verse, you know, because his eye skipped down. And we've now discovered some of, you know, some of those kinds of errors. So everyone, as far as I can tell, even Joseph Smith, he's looking in the instrument. He has got to read it off correctly. The scribe's got to hear it correctly. The scribe's got to write it correctly. Then they'll copy it correctly, we hope. The typesetter will set it correctly, we hope. Editors will make the right decisions and so forth. Um, we pretty much, everyone's always tried to do their best. I think we only have one typesetter, the 1841 British typesetter, where they were cutting corners. They were cheating Brigham Young, and they did a number of things. They didn't even proof the last few signatures. They just set the type, ran them, and didn't even check them. They were, I, I used to say everybody always tried their best. Now I say everybody's always tried to do their best, except the 1841 British typesetters. But um, I believe there's, that the Lord gave Joseph Smith the text that he saw, that he read. And when the angel or the Lord says the translation's correct, that's what the Lord's referring to, what Joseph Smith saw in the instrument. We can't directly recover that. We can't because Joseph didn't videotape it. You know, and so we have what the scribe wrote down originally. We have 
and we have only 28% of that. We have then the printer's manuscript, which is the sec next iteration. And that's got visual errors. When they copied, they made visual errors. When the scribe took it down in the original, they misheard sometimes. Uh, so we will see in the printer's manuscript visual errors. We will see the 1830 typesetter making visual errors. Most of the errors nowadays are visual errors that you people might make. Um, but nonetheless, I think even with this, uh, we don't really have any drastic errors. Contrary to the Tanners in their book on 3,913 changes in the Book of Mormon, these are mostly grammatical changes. They even count typos being corrected as changes in the Book of Mormon. I, that shows they're not being really forthright in their counting. But uh, even then, uh, there are only a couple places where uh, a doctrinal issue was sort of messed up a little. Uh, nothing to, you know, really cause trouble. But it's interesting that the original reading is fully doctrinally correct. And the mistake made is a minor one. The one, one that I think of is the original text. Um, uh, Alma tells Corianton that he is to return to the Zoramites and to acknowledge his fault and repair the wrong which he has done. But Oliver mistakenly copied repair as retain the wrong which you have done. And Brother Talmage in 1920 couldn't figure out how it should be retained, so he just took it out. So the current text reads that Corianton is supposed to go back and acknowledge his fault and the wrong which he has done. He's just supposed to say he's sorry. The original text says, no, he's supposed to not only say he's sorry, but he's to repair it. He's supposed to do something. Well, that's the true doctrine of repentance. But the current reading doesn't really cause any problem, but it's great to know that actually Alma was telling his son, no, you need to also repair the wrong which you've done. So is that doctrinal? Well, I guess, but you know, it still means that the original is correct. It isn't that we really went astray. There are other places in the Book of Mormon that say precisely that, that you are to confess your wrongs and repair the wrong which you have done. And so it isn't like we really have these. And there's another one. It's a minor one, too. There, there aren't doctrinal changes, and there aren't really changes in the story. You know, the Queen, Queen Lamoni's or the queen of King Lamoni, when she comes out of her trance, the original text says she clapped her hands. But the typesetter misread clapped as clasped. So it's got clasped. Well, does that make a real big difference? Well, not really, you know, but it does mean that she was more Pentecostal. You know, clasping your hand is sort of meek. But clapping your hands, she's got the spirit. So, but still, you know, we like to read, we, we, we see the original, we say, yeah, that's right, that's great, you know. But we can live with class too, you know. And it, it, so there aren't these kinds of changes that sometimes people like to make out that are just outrageous and so forth. Most of them are grammatical. Most Joseph Smith changed which to who over 900 times. Our Father, which art in heaven? He changed to our Father, who art in heaven. Well, in most languages, which and who are the same relative pronoun. It doesn't even make any difference. So the most common change Joseph Smith made won't even show up in translations most of the time. So, in fact, very few languages. So I just find... So much of these arguments about change is not very interesting. We are glad, though, we have the printer's manuscript. It could have been destroyed by the tornado. 
Somebody could have stolen it. We're glad we have rattlesnakes. <laughs> it's for scholars and it's for interested lay readers. And there are a lot of people that like to see, you know, I think the original will even be, it's going to be closer to the actual dictated, you know, text by Joseph Smith because it's what they wrote down. But, you know, the, the closer you get back, the more you see the hand of God in these things, despite the fact that they might have misspelled things or whatever. You see, you see the word of the Lord being transmitted by real people in real time with their own spellings, and I love it that way. I mean, you know, it's something that most people, you know, you wouldn't want to take it to church to read the Book of Mormon from. It's really hard to to deal with it. But very often you can you can use it to study the text in a detailed way, or you just sense the transmission of a revealed text. So I think a lot of members somehow think sometimes the Book of Mormon they open up, yeah, this is what Joseph Smith got. Even the verse numbers, you know, the chapters and so forth. It's not true. It's not true. It's, it's, a, it's it, the original chapters are longer, and they're all one big sentence, more or less, because even though they, they really the sentences are ending, but there's no punctuation to let you know you've got to figure it out. So um, I think it helps people realize the text came in a different way than the, the way it's fashioned today. Well, there are issues that do come up in the actual changes that occur in the text. But again, I think, I, I would say most members um, are interested in the printed version of what they have. So you're, I don't think it's, it's right to pretend that everyone is going to be interested in the older form. We can look at the Book of Commandments, the, the Revelation book that came out, you know. And I myself really like to look at it because I can see, first of all, Sidney Rigdon changing the grammar. And I can see that actually the way it was given to Joseph Smith was actually pretty good. We could have kept it. We didn't really have to have the grammatical editing by Sidney. But Sidney's is still the same meaning, but it's a little more cleaned up and so forth. I like the raw text. And you'll see this if you read the printer's manuscript. You'll see the things that we've mentioned that, that uh, people have, have choked over. You know, they was yet wroth, and in them days are in the text. They're in the printer's manuscript. But we are now discovering that language is not necessarily upstate New York dialect. People have automatically assumed this, but we have found it in, as I've indicated, early modern English in the 1600s. In them days was in academic writing. So maybe this text, even though we have sometimes, you know, you'll read it in the printers and you say, oh, wow. This sounds like Geneva Road here in, in, in Utah Valley. Well, maybe you're wrong. Maybe it does sound like it, but maybe they've kept the pure language, you know? So it, it, reading that, reading that will give you a feel for of the way the Lord, I think, gave the text, even though it's not in our standard language. So you'll get the language aspect, too. A lot of people have trouble with that. But um, the evidence we're finding is to the contrary, that this is actually a sustainable way of uh, having biblical-styled language, not necessarily, um, you know, the, the uneducated farm boy's language. So that's, that's a different thing, too. But... You know, it, it isn't, I, I think we have to be, you know, our, our purpose, really, I think we can't say our purpose is to have every member buy this and have it in their home, you know. I, I, I don't think that, I think getting people interested in seeing what it was like and seeing, getting closer to the revealed word of God is something. 
and and having it there for family members to look at and say, you know, this is this is what it was like back in 1829 when the Lord revealed this text and it was copied then to take to the printer. I I like that view. I'm going to list all 900 or so of those cases of which going to who or whom. So you can actually see, and you can see the ones Joseph didn't change, and maybe why he didn't change them, and so forth. I, I, I think it's, you know, sometimes when you see them in isolation, people uh, react wrongly to it. And I think that's one of the reasons when we come out with this first part of Volume 3 of the critical text, first two parts, 1,400 pages, on all the grammatical editing of the Book of Mormon. And, and then we're going to show that virtually all of this bad English was in early modern English, and it wasn't considered bad English originally. So we want to put it in context. I think people using the Joseph Smith Papers volume just have to realize, okay, this is the raw form of it. We're, we're seeing it. We're seeing it. But you have to look at it in, in the larger picture and see all the changes and why they're being done and how English was earlier. So I'm going to argue for both sides of the coin here. You know, um, I think we as a church were, Joseph himself was a little embarrassed by the form the language was in. And, but it wasn't his. I don't think he said, oh, yeah, that's, you know, I, I say that, and I, I said it that way because now I've changed my mind, you know. I, I, I think he made the editing for the 37th edition because everyone was complaining. I mean, if you're reading the Book of Mormon and you read They Was Yet Wrath, are you going to get the message or are you going to say, ooh, wow, that's bad English? Most people are not going to get the message. They're going to be stopped. Okay, so this is why we edit it. This is a very good read. I think Joe Smith made the right decision. For the standard text of members of the church, it needs to be in a more standard English. However, for those who are really interested in the text, and we can give a context for what's going on, I think it's just wonderful to see, see it closer to how it was actually given. So I'll take both.